All right. Well, everybody, I, you may have gotten a notification recording is in progress, which means we are getting started. Um, I'm so pleased with uh, who's, who our guest is today, Tom Wheeler. I'm going to be saying more about him in a minute. Um, but I want everyone to know that this is also going out over LinkedIn Live. So welcome to those of you from LinkedIn, either uh, live right now or in the recording afterwards. Um, before we get started with Tom, I wanted to note that today's talk is part of a series called The Internet We Deserve. We are talking to notable business, policy, tech, and academic leaders who have been central to the creation of the internet as we know it today. The series is hosted by the Burn Center for Social Change at Northeastern University. Uh, the Burn Center, uh, of which I am a part, develops innovative participatory and equitable approaches to solving public problems using new technology, and in particular, artificial intelligence. The center is led by a growing team of accomplished and recognized change makers, focusing on strengthening democracy and improving governance tackling climate change, advancing education outcomes, and deepening economic justice, as well as promoting better health. We'll put a link in the chat to learn more uh, and to sign up to receive future updates. That will be on the Burns site at burns.northeastern.edu. And we will be continuing this fall uh, with the Internet uh, We Deserve series with Shoshana Zuba from Harvard, uh, a colleague of Tom's. Um, and other prominent leaders as we continue uh, throughout the rest of the year. So stay tuned. Uh, again, you can ask your questions in the chat, either if you're on the Zoom meeting or in LinkedIn Live, and we'll be monitoring those and working them into the conversation with Tom, who in conversations prior to this, I have found is more than willing to tackle almost any question that gets thrown his way. So let me tell you about Tom. For those of you not familiar, a businessman, an author, and probably most famously, the chair of the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, from 2013 to 2017. While there, he led efforts that resulted in the adoption of what's known as net neutrality. We're going to get into that. Uh, he also led privacy protections for consumers, increased cybersecurity, uh, and was involved in countless other policies. His chairmanship was described as the most productive commission in the history of the agency, which in recent history is not a high bar. Um, but uh, throughout the years, the FCC has been an incredibly important uh, agency for both the internet and media uh, and telecommunications. During the Obama-Biden transition prior to uh, his chairmanship of the FCC, uh, Tom was in, in charge of activities overseeing uh, agencies of government dealing with science, technology, space, and the arts. That was during the transition. Prior, as an entrepreneur, he helped or started multiple companies in cable, wireless, and video communications. And he's the only person selected both to the Cable Television Hall of Fame and the Wireless Hall of Fame, which President Obama jokingly said made him the Bo Jackson of telecom. Um, he's currently a visiting fellow in governance studies at Brookings, CEO of the Shiloh Group, a strategy development investment company. And prior to be appointed, but prior to being appointed chairman of the FCC by President Obama, he was the managing director of core capital partners, a VC firm, Venture Capital, investing in early stage internet protocol based companies. Hence, my interest in talking with him because he knows the history of the internet better than most. Uh, he also co-founded Smart Brief, the internet's largest curated information service for vertical markets. Prior to that, he was associated with the NCTA, the National Cable Television Association. He was president and CEO, 79 to 84. And after that, CEO of many high-tech companies, including the first to offer high-speed delivery to home computers and the first digital video satellite service. He also has served as president and CEO of the Cellular Telecommunications and Internet Association, CTIA. Now, be, be, beyond all of that, he finds time to write lots of books, including Take Command, Leadership Lessons from the Civil War, 
Mr. Lincoln's tea mails, the untold story of how Abraham Lincoln used the telegraph to win the Civil War, from Gutenberg to Google, the history of our future, and most recently, TechLash, uh, which came out last year. And we're going to talk about some of the issues in TechLash as well uh, throughout this conversation. So with that long introduction, but I think necessary, so all of you can be informed about uh, Tom's uh, accomplishments. Um, Tom, thank you for joining us today and welcome. Hello, John. It's great to be with you and everybody. And you know, I'm sure everybody recognizes that you're the guy who wrote the book on Google explaining when nobody knew what search was all about, just what was happening and what the future would look like. <laughs> Thank you. So I look forward to this discussion. Yeah, as do I, as do I. So we've got a lot to cover. Um, and I want to start with, I guess you could call it a news hook, um, because your work as FCC chair under the Obama administration is in the news. Uh, next month, there will be a vote on reinstating the net neutrality policies that you instated uh, prior to the Trump administration. Uh, and I think it's it's just interesting that this is coming around full circle. Those, those net neutrality uh, policies were rescinded in the last administration. Um, so I wanna start with a very simple question, which is what is net neutrality and why does it matter? Well, the basic concept of net neutrality is that the internet as the essential network of the 21st century needs to be fair and open and needs to have uh, ongoing oversight uh, to make decisions about the changes that technology and marketplace developments um, deliver. And this is not a revolutionary thought, as many of the internet service providers who oppose it would want you to believe. I mean, uh, you know, you talked about how I love history and like to write books about history. Um, you can trace this idea back to the feudal era. And, and as we were coming, as society was coming out of the Dark Ages, in which the feudal lords had set the rules, there established, there, there was established what became known as English common law, um, because instead of being a local lord's decision, it was a common concept across all courts. And one of those concepts in English common law was the so-called duty to deal. And, and it, it took the following kind of manifestation um, in, in the 14th century. Um, that um, the guy who ran the ferry across the river, who previously prioritized the uh, produce of his lord, the feudal lord, now had to provide um, non-discriminatory access to that ferry. He could still charge for it, but he couldn't pick and choose and say, I'm going to favor you and I'm going to favor somebody else. And, and it's an idea that has we have seen throughout history. You know, when, when the Pacific Telegraph Act was passed in 1860, one of the provisions of the act was that this new first high-speed digital, and not digital, electronic network needed for, to provide non-discriminatory access, that it was first come, first served to get on the wire. And then when the telephone replaced the telegraph, the same kind of non-discriminatory access was expected of the telephone. And the internet probably wouldn't have happened, or at least would have happened in a very different way, if it hadn't have been for that non-discriminatory access, because you know, everybody on this on this uh, session will recall those modems that we used to have to plug in between our computer and the jack on the telephone jack on the wall that would screech and turn digital code into an analog signal a telephone network could, could carry. 
if the telephone network hadn't been required to carry those signals on a non-discriminatory basis, the odds are we would have seen a very different approach to the internet, a much slower rollout. And so what we were trying to do was just continue that tradition. Where you have an essential network, it needs to be open and fair. And because we exist in a time where things are changing so fast, we needed to make sure also that there is ongoing oversight to make judgments about those developments. Now, I mean, put that way, it certainly seems hard to oppose. But as you uh, noted, uh, there is strong opposition to the idea of net neutrality. There are millions of dollars being spent even today, right now, uh, in the District of Columbia to, to, uh, to lobby against the, uh, the reinstatement of net neutrality policies. Can you, and maybe this is unfair, but you know, you've, you've been on all sides of this debate over the many years you, of your career. Um, what's the objection? What's the argument that's made to say, no, 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 we, we, we don't want neutrality on the network. We, we want to be able to discriminate against you know, certain kinds of traffic or packets or, or so on. Well, there are two principal arguments that the ISPs, the Internet Service Providers, uh, put up. Um, one is that by restricting their activities, you will restrict their ability to make investments in building out broadband, and everybody wants broadband. <laughs> and there are, you know, there's a, the, the, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce put out a press relief release not too long ago bragging that they were going to spend a million dollars on an ad campaign, a TV ad campaign uh, against net neutrality. The National Cable Television Association, which you point out I used to head way back when, um, uh, also is spending similar kinds of funds. And their argument is, you know, we're building out Internet for all with with federal money, with $40 billion of federal money. But that um, we won't be encouraged to do this because of these heavy handed rules. Well, if there ever was a <laughs> proof of you, can, you can bite the hand that feeds you. I guess that's what's what we're seeing here. But the other argument that they that they make, uh, and I should I should back up and say, if you look at the statistics as to capital expenditures by ISPs during the pendency of our net neutrality rule and after it was taken off, they're actually greater when the rule is in place than when it was taken off. Mm -hmm. But that's the argument you hear. Oh, this is going to hurt investment. The second argument you hear is, we've been good. What are you doing? Why should you why should you do this? Because we've been responsible, which of course overlooks the fact that the reason we that, that net neutrality first raised its head in 2005 was uh was the fact that Comcast was throttling um BitTorrent, which was delivering streaming video in competition to Comcast cable service. So they throttled it so that you couldn't get a competitive service and the FCC stepped in. Um, and there is a history of those kinds of uh, events. Um, and I can certainly understand, you know, as you said, I was in industry for years and years and years. Nobody likes to be regulated. But the fact of the matter is that we're dealing with the most important network of the 21st century, as I said a minute ago. And the thought that that network would be without any oversight is just inconceivable. Yeah. And um, and so uh, hopefully um, on April 25th, uh, Chairwoman Rosenworcel and the Democratic majority of the FCC, because the Republicans have announced they'll vote against it, 
uh, we'll be able to pass this on a three to two vote. So to get into a few more of the details, um, I think all of the ISPs and the cable providers, the, the, the companies that, that provide, you know, probably everybody online right now with their connection to the internet, they all claim that they certainly uh, support the idea of neutrality towards traffic, towards packets. They're not going to discriminate on that. But they do take issue with other portions of the of the net neutrality policies. Um, and there's one that you recently educated me on that, I, that I'd love you to unpack, which, which is called general business conduct, uh, conducting your business as a common carrier or a regulated body in a just and reasonable manner. Um, and this seems to be uh, broad enough to spark some fear in, 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 in industry that it might be misinterpreted and over, over rotated on. Can you, can you tell us what that means, this general business conduct uh, phrasing and just in reasonable manner? So the um, is a requirement that has, again, gone back for years that you have to act um, in a just and reasonable um, manner. And, and somebody needs to be making that kind of a decision. And it's all the more important when you have all the fast moving uh, developmental, uh, both technological and marketplace developments that we have now. Let me give you an example. We all see the headlines about all of the antitrust suits that have been filed against the major platforms. And, um, and that, um, and I'm, I'm a huge proponent of antitrust uh, enforcement. But the difficulty with antitrust enforcement is that it is targeted to an action in a company and takes years before you get a solution. And really what you need to have is the ability to, to make decisions as developments occur rather than waiting for the ill effects and then trying to recapture what existed before. I, I keep referring to it as, as the digital Maginot line. Remember the Maginot line that France built to protect itself after the First World War? Uh, and, and, the, and the Germans went right around it using a new technology. We don't want to have fixed emplacements. We don't want to have fixed rules. We want to have rules that are agile, just like the behavior of the companies is agile and technology provides agile situations. I, you know, I, um, I think I told you, John, about the story of a unnamed ISP CEO who came to see me at one point in time and was unhappy to say the least with this concept that we would put into the rule that, that, that they had to be acting in a just and reasonable manner and that future FCCs were empowered to make that decision. And he says to me, I'll never forget it. I'm sitting in my office, we're sitting in my office at the FCC. And he says, well, you know, Tom, he says, I have confidence in you and, and, and I'm sure that you would never do anything uh, uh, unwise in, 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 in this power, with this power. But I worry about the people who are going to follow you. And I turned to him and I said, well, you know, blank his name. Um, I uh, feel the same way. <laughs> and he looks at me. And I said, yeah, I said, I'm sure that you wouldn't do anything that was triggered this, but I worry about the people who are going to follow you. And he gets this deer in the headlight look, says, oh, my God. And that was what we were trying to put in place. I mean, one of the precepts in, in my most recent book, TechLash, who makes the rules in the digital Gilded Age, is that in the industrial era, we created regulatory oversight structures that were patterned after industrial management, which was rigid, sclerotic, rules-based. And so we're just, we're surprised when we see a federal government that is a, is a bureaucratic uh, rules-based structure. We need now 
to follow the same kind of management practices that we see the digital companies doing? How do we look at, at risk management? How do we create an agile environment and have the ability to respond as situations change? And that's what we are trying to do. And that's what hopefully the FCC will enact later uh, in on the 25th of, of April in so far as putting a general conduct rule in place. Right. Uh, you know, one other thing that I noticed in, in, in reading the proposed rulemaking um, is that there is an allowance for the FCC to regulate rates. Um, and I can only imagine that strikes terror in their hearts because beyond general, you know, business conduct, you know, uh, rate regulation is always very uh, fraught. Um, and I imagine that might be fueling those multi-million dollar ad campaigns. Um, is that what they're really concerned about? Um, you know, it's fascinating. You never see that in their multi-million dollar ad campaign. So, uh, you know, nobody is really, you know, I think going to come out with a lobbying stance that says, hey, we don't like this because we want to be able to raise your rates. Um, <laughs> but um, but I think so. So so I, I can't tell you how Chairwoman Rosenworcel is is making her uh, decisions, but I can tell you how I made a decision on this. And and that was that we decided that you know, we would keep. Um, rate regulation in, so let me back up. So net neutrality is really about making ISPs, common carriers subject to Title II of the Communications Act. And one of the things in Title II is rate regulation. There are, there are 47 sections to Title II, and we decided to forbear from all but like 25 of those because we said those those don't those apply to the old telephone company they don't apply to today but we left in rate regulation and um and i said at the time that i had no intention of enforcing rate regulation um but that i did i thought it was irresponsible to um to hand tie um my successors and whatever they may see um, in their realities. And so we left it in. Uh, Jessica Rosenworcel has said the same thing. She has said she has no intention of enforcing rate regulation at this point in time. And you know, as competition increases for the last mile of broadband, which hopefully it will be doing, has been doing and will be doing even more, um, Hopefully, we'll see a situation where competition controls rates. But if it doesn't, and something that we cannot envision today becomes the reality, I don't think that in 2024, um, a, a group of commissioners should make a decision that that hands ties the, somebody in 2044. Right. Now, yeah, first of all, uh... I certainly don't feel like as an individual consumer that, that rates have been held steady. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure anyone else on this call does, but I, I'm going to go down one more, you know, sort of segment of this rabbit hole uh, and then okay. we'll go back. And, and that, that goes to what, what I think you're referring to more broadly, which is the power of a, of a government agency to regulate industry at all. And uh, there, there is a Supreme Court case that uh, is current that, as I understand it, is taking this question up, which could make a lot of this, as I understand it, and I want you to, to comment on this, somewhat moot because uh, the ability for the FCC to do this kind of regulation rests on a previous case uh, known as the Chevron deference. Um, and that has to do with how an agency uh, regulates an industry, and that might be overturned um, in the current court. So can you tell us what Chevron deference is and, and why it matters to the, what we've been discussing? So Chevron deference, first of all, applies to all agencies, not just the FCC. 
And it was based on a 1986, I think uh, it, it was, National Resources Resource Defense Council versus Chevron, um, which was a Supreme Court case in which um, the EPA was making a decision that um, was not explicitly spelled out in the statutory in the statute, but clearly was inferred and the decision to trigger it a matter of deference. And the Supreme Court ended up saying, hey, you know, we've got expert agencies for a reason. And when Congress was imprecise as to specifically what they were calling for, um, we need to look to the expert agency to tell us really how should this be implemented given the current realities. Now, you know, it's interesting. We go back to net neutrality. There is a was a case before the Supreme Court called the Brand X case, in which the decision was written by Justice Thomas. Um, and the question was whether cable operators should be under Title II uh, of the Communications Act, like they are under net neutrality. And the FCC at that point in time had said no. And the Supreme Court, written by Justice Thomas, said, well, we need to give deference to the expert agency. When our open internet order, net neutrality, was appealed to the courts, it withstood court challenge on the basis of Chevron deference. Situations have changed. There are decisions that have to be made. This is why we have an expert agency reaffirm the FCC's decision. When the Trump FCC repealed our decision, it was affirmed on the basis of Chevron deference. Despite the fact that one of the judges in the opinion wrote that the FCC's decision bears no resemblance to reality, still, they are the expert agency and we need to provide them deference. This whole thing has become a Federalist Society issue, you know, this part of the deep state and mm -hmm. these 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 bureaucrats who are making these decisions and therefore they have brought to the Supreme Court um, this case, uh, which will decide um, what's the future of Chevron deference. And, 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 and it has the potential to literally cripple administrative decisions because, because I mean, I have sat in the room um, multiple times over the years as Congress has put together a piece of legislation. And the number of times I have heard them say, well, let's just send this to the agency to decide, rather than having to make the tough decisions themselves um, is legion. The number of times I've heard that is, is legion. And if we deny the fact that there are people who wake up in the morning and think nothing but this particular issue and their expertise ought to be listened to yeah subject to their own reasonableness then uh then we're in trouble um and so i'm very fearful about what the court will do yeah uh, well um okay so let's pull back out and and, and i want to ask you about a, a, a few other things related i believe but uh, um, but uh let's pull back to a topic that the burn center has spent a fair amount of time on the past few years um, and, and has other lecture series, um, which I encourage everyone to check out um, around the impact of, of artificial intelligence. So uh, the current administration has uh, has uh, released a pretty you know substantial uh, executive order. Uh, on artificial intelligence. It ran more than 100 pages. 100 pages. It was informed by legions of experts. Um, and 
I, I would say it was reasonably well received by the by by all sides, the industry, you know, uh, AI proponents, AI detractors, uh, as a as a good step forward. But I did read a piece that you wrote, um, uh, you know, praising it in those words, but also saying that it wasn't enough. And can you say generally why? I have a feeling this ties to the thesis of your book, Tech Lab. Yeah, John. Uh, the um, I mean, first of all. Hooray for the Biden administration for coming up with this incredibly well thought out um, uh, executive order in such a fast period. I mean, this was lightning fast government activity, um, planting a flag in the, in the ground. And, and as such, uh, as the piece you cited, uh, as I wrote in the piece you cited, that it is, it is worthy of, of lots of praise. However, the president, when he rolled it out, said, and Congress needs to act uh, and pass AI legislation because what he was able to do was limited. And, and you know, there are like 150 different recommendations in there, but only a handful of them have any enforcement teeth and that is because he tied them to the defense production a korean war era uh statute that gives the president authority to act on matters of national and economic security and um and so it was under that authority that he said um uh foundation models need to have uh, uh, uh red team testing and need to have report on that and put in safeguards etc absolutely but you know we all look at the presidency as being this incredibly powerful position but that but the defense production act was as far as his authority went on this and most of the other things in the EO are, well, let's do a study on, or I want you to have an office in your agency that looks at AI or look at how you're going to use AI in your activities. And, and, and we need to have policies that say, this is how we will have oversight of AI. And I think it goes back to what we were talking about a minute ago. And and that is just what is just and reasonable, right? Just what is a, a a logical way of doing of dealing with something that is is constantly iterating itself, um, and changing the way we think about things, and how do we create an agile government structure that is capable of keeping up with and dealing with that kind of change. You know, I, I want to ask you that, you know, maybe to 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 say a bit more, how do we? I mean, it's a good question. Um, you know, could you imagine changes to the to the current approach, or is it that we need to take an entirely new approach in terms of how we think about governance related to, you know, industries, informational industries, which are fundamentally distinct from from those that as you point out shape the the structure of our regulatory frameworks to date well this is what techlash is is all about and um and it proposes it follows up on um on a research project that Phil Revere uh, Gene Kimmelman and I did um over at the Harvard Kennedy School um, in which we recommended the establishment of a digital platform agency. But uh, that's the headline. But what's really important is that that agency has to behave differently from the traditional regulatory agency and to have the kind of agility and, and prioritization by risk uh, risk assessment that uh, that we talked about um, a, a, a minute ago, and I think that we're not going to be able to keep keep pace with AI um, through uh, uh, 535 members of Congress. 
Um, and, uh, and there needs to be some kind of a structure that operates differently from existing agencies um, and has the agility to deal with things and address this just and reasonable question again. And, and let me be real clear on one other point. That this is not to say something untoward about the Federal Trade Commission or the FCC or other agencies that are out there right now trying to figure out how do I deal with, with AI. It's But it's the fact that they're stuck with industrial era statutes that they are stuck with industrial era decisions, that they are stuck with judges who have made stature, who have made a, a judicial interpretation based on those decisions, that they are stuck with staffs who are incredibly well-meaning, but are not AI natives. Um, and, and, and we need to have the proper level of expertise and the proper level of investment and the proper level of agility right. to keep up with the changes. Yeah. So from, from looking forward to how we, you know, might make better decisions about governance, I, I want to ask you to sort of cast your gaze back as you have as a historian. Um, I want to ask you what you think might be some of the most important or seminal moments in the history of the internet that that got us to where we are now maybe overlooked moments um or overlooked you know uh stories uh, i'm curious about that for a number of reasons but particularly given your your own history you know what what brought us to where we are now? And, and, and are there moments that maybe we might have made different decisions? Oh, of course there are moments where we might have made different decisions. Let's just stipulate to that. No, but, you know, I, I have to pause and say I had the incredible good fortune as a young man to be tutored on this concept of packetized digital networks by the man who developed it, Paul Barron. And um, and I, I, did, I had no idea at the point in time how fortunate I, I was. But if you want to talk about seminal events, uh, it was Paul Barron's um, uh, extrapolation that instead of having centralized networks um, that were uh, exposed to enemy attack that then could take down our ability to have a second, have a response to a, to attack. We needed to have this fishnet-like uh, digital packetized network, and um, and and it was it was rejected by AT and T and and others because they saw that it meant a whole new era of not competition. So so you got to start with Paul, and you got to start with with packet switching. But then you go on. We talked a minute ago about how um, there wouldn't have been um, the internet as we know it if telephone companies hadn't been forced to carry it. Right. Um, we had a situation where um, transistors and, and the invention of the transistor and the silicon microchip, um, which powers everything that we do on the internet, um, was released to the public because of the fact that in 1956, AT&T signed a consent decree with the Justice Department in which they said uh, that they would make available uh, the patents, publicly available, the patents that uh, Bell Labs had developed. And, and a guy by the name of William Shockley at Bell Labs won the Nobel Prize for developing the, the transistor uh, which is at the heart of a microprocessor, but it was held captive by the Bell system, and suddenly it was opened. And and you know, no less a figure than Andy Grove, who was one of the co-founders of Intel, said we couldn't have done it unless we had had access to that intellectual property, which was broken loose by the federal government. And then we go to the fact that the early internet was paid for by by DARPA, we go to the fact that the TCP/IP that 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 Vint Cerf and and Bob Kahn 
developed was paid for by um, the um, by the NSF, um, and you can just go on and on and on and on with with these. You know, it there was no um, immaculate conception of the internet and what we know today. And the other thing that is important is you'll notice through through that that entire timeline, and we can keep going throughout that entire timeline. Each one of those activities was made possible by an action by the federal government and federal taxpayers. And the fact that we get to a point where it is now, as you chronicle in your book about Google, it is now in such a strong position that you can turn around and say to government, go away. No, you can't. We got here because of government action. We need to have rules that are set not on the basis of what is best for me, but what is best for us. And that's how we got to this point. That's how why how we should continue. And that's the basis of what net neutrality is all about. Yeah, I think you just tied it all together very well. And by the way, I want to remind the audience, please put some questions in on the side if you have them. Um, as we'll get to them shortly. Um, but, you know, you've worked at the intersection of government and industry and, you know, cutting edge technology for most of your career. And I'm curious, as you survey the landscape right now, um, if it feels different, if it feels like perhaps we are losing our belief and or our will to create government that we trust and that we understand can enable through, you know, organizations like the NSF or the DOD or, you know, the various agencies that, you know, the antitrust um, that sort of unleashed the internet. They were like, okay, great. We're glad that happened, but we don't need it anymore. There seems to be a, a general sensibility that that government has outlived its usefulness, and 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 now we just it's we perhaps we trust captains of industry more than we do our collective instrument of governance. Um, is that just me being a, a little bit naive, or do you think that that something's changing in the air as it relates to the role of government and whether we're going to allow government to be an execute, you know, the sort of executor of our collective will? Oh, John, you just you know, pricked a hot topic with me they uh, for 40 for the last 40 years we have been fed the line that you know one of the greatest lies is i'm from the government and i'm here to help you and the government is the problem not the solution well that dates you know, to I, I that dates that's why it's back 40 years uh, and i i um you know, I wrote a, a book on Lincoln, as you know, and um, and and one of Lincoln's great expressions that I found very relevant to today is the job of government is to do for people what they cannot do for themselves. And that um, and, and in this environment, what is shocking to me. Is that for the first time in American history. We have not stepped up to the impact of a new technology, a major new technology on the American people. And TechLash is the story of what we did for the, in the industrial era to deal with the abuses that accompanied the great things that happened and the wonderful products and the reduction in prices and the creation of jobs and all the great things that happened in the industrial era. And we stepped up to them. And we said there need to be guardrails. And we have failed to take that step in the digital revolution. Except that there is one other thing that complicates that reality for us today. And that is the fact that 
we used to be the world leaders in policy development for new technologies. And our failure to act has allowed other governments to make those decisions. And those decisions, because we are talking about an interconnected market, those decisions end up having impacts over here right. on our consumers and on our companies. And, and so not only have we failed ourselves, but we have failed to lead the world and as a result, are going to see the rules being made by somebody else. Yeah. Uh, well, I and one of the first questions to pop in here, I noticed, is a great uh, related question. Um, because one of the most aggressive, and I'm going to set aside, not that we can't come back to it in the limited time we have, but I'm going to set aside sort of the, the Chinese internet or the Russian internet, you know, but but uh, in markets that where where we are, you know, free and fair trading partners, if you will, un unfettered, such as Europe. Europe has been an, a, a, a leader, not that we all agree with how they've led, but a leader, they have filled the vacuum. Um, uh, the EU in particular has filled the vacuum of, of regulatory framework for the internet. And a uh, question from Leora Kornfeld is, is, she's curious to hear your thoughts on the DMA, and I would presume the DSA as well, uh, in the EU, um, as he sees it as turning data stores into a commons, uh, uh, requirements for portability and interoperability in particular. Well, I am I am a huge supporter of interoperability. Um, I think it's the super tool, uh, uh, to quote um, uh, Fiona Scott Morton, um, that it is that absent interoperability, uh, then you have a bunch of isolated um, uh, islands and you need, uh, you need, you have to have interoperability. But to the broader question of, of uh, the DMA and the DSA and even the GDPR and the AI Act, why is America sitting here watching? And, 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 and I've met with the um, MEPs, um, I have met with um, Marguerite Fessinger and others who are implementing these rules. Um, these are bright, articulate, um, well-intentioned um, individuals um, who see the world from their perspective. You know, it's the old line about where you stand depends on where you sit. And and I respect that. And for the most part, you know, I think I think they're they're moving down the right kind of path. Might have done something tweak here or tweak there, but they're moved down the right kind of path. But they're doing it because we failed to say this is where we stand. The last time that a senior federal government official was in Europe working on harmonizing the policies of the two com of the two countries to to uh, trading groups um was when I was there with John Sallet, the FCC general counsel right after we passed net neutrality to help the EU as they were coming together to write what their policies would be on net neutrality and our goal was, not that you have to do everything like we did it, but we need to be compatible with each other. We need to be yeah. working off of the same kind of, of set of goals. And we did. And now we don't have that kind of a relationship because we don't know where we stand. One of the questions that just came up in follow up to that is, uh, and I'm going to do my best to summarize. So if the questioner can, 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 Correct me if I don't get it right, but what's different between their perspectives and ours, the EU perspective and ours? I, I, I heard, uh, I was talking with Larry Lessig uh, in, in a previous instantiation of this series, and she's, he said something to the effect of the Europeans 
worry about what might happen and legislate against it in advance. And we wait for something bad to happen and, and then we sue someone. <laughs> Who am I to quarrel with Larry Lessig, right? Uh, no, I think he's I think he's absolutely right. I mean, our tendency is to sit back and let things metastasize and become really bad before we do something about it. And the Europeans have been saying, how do we have rules of the road? And um and 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 I think, you know, it's a is it is it ex post or ex ante? Um, that you want to be dealing with these issues. And it's a combination of both. But right now, in this country, we ignore ex ante. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me pull back and uh, invite a few more questions. If they come in, I, I will cut over to them. But I, I wanted to ask you about, you know, when I think Tech Lash, the title of your last book, uh, I think about the consumer backlash, which occurred uh, roughly around the topic of privacy, which I think is not well understood in American society, but uh, just these companies might be getting too big. They might know too much. They might be getting too powerful, um, but we love them. They're very convenient. They do uh, so much for us. They don't charge us for that, that we understand as you know, the Google is free, Facebook is free, um, Apple makes a great product, so on and so forth. Do you believe that that these companies, the sort of the big five, if you will, the U.S. companies, mostly West Coast based companies, are too big, um, are too powerful, and should be uh, uh, corralled in various ways? Or do you think that the market will sort this out? So, um, first of all, there's nothing um, against the law about being big. All right. The, 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 the law, the antitrust law, for instance, doesn't say anything about being big. They say they, they look at what are the effects. And, and, and so my previous book, From Gutenberg to Google, one of the points that it tried to emphasize was that it is never the primary change, the primary technology that is transformational, always the secondary effects. And, and, that, um, and that we need to be looking at what those secondary effects are and dealing with them. The privacy issue that you raise. I mean, the fact that that the internet created the, act, the the ability to go out there and and siphon off all of our private information, put it into an algorithm, and turn around and send stuff back out to us. That's the technology. The effect of that technology is misinformation, disinformation, lies, um, and taking my personal data my private information and turning it into a corporate asset. And, and we need to have rules around those kinds of effects. As a result of passing the net neutrality rules, we also implemented for the first time in the federal government, a set of privacy rules. It applied to the networks because that's as far as the FCC's authority goes. But it said, hey, you've got the same right of privacy that you have on the telephone networks on broadband Internet access. 57 days after the Trump administration and the Republican Congress took over, they passed a law repealing that. And the law was supported, of course, by the networks that didn't want to have restrictions on what they could do with your personal data because they see everything that you do. Right. Google or Facebook may see a lot. The network that takes you to Google or Facebook also takes you to your insurance company and every place else. They see everything. They didn't want to have to, to deal, to, to, to obey that kind of privacy rule. And the platforms like 
Facebook, Google, etc. They were afraid that it would spread over into them and they would have the same kind of restrictions. So they banded together, went to Congress, got the Congress to pass a law repealing this privacy and President Trump um, uh, uh, signed it into law. Um, and therefore we have no privacy. Um, and and we need to address that, yeah. you know? And again, back to, the, to Europe. Europe did the GDPR. God bless them for the GDPR. The GDPR has lots of problems with it, but at the same point in time, at least somebody did something and we have been afraid to do that. Yeah, yeah, we have. I, I, there are other questions in the, uh, in the Q and A, but I'm, I promised everyone to keep this to an hour and we're coming to it. Um, and so I want, I want to take this time to just thank you. Uh, I, I you. would recommend, uh, everyone pick up Tom's work, both TechLash and, uh, Gutenberg and Google in particular. Um, although I'm a huge fan of the Telegraph. And I think it's it's an underappreciated uh, technological advance, and uh, so you put on, on on Lincoln and the Telegraph is really worth it, given that we have had presidential candidates use exactly those kinds of new media to to uh, commandeer public attention. Certainly, Twitter in two, 2016 comes to mind. Um, but thank you so much for, for, for coming. I hope that we might have another conversation like this at some point in the future, uh, because I found it incredibly uh, uh, insightful and revealing. Um, and I would you know, commend everyone to, to, to look further into Tom's work. And I need to very quickly remind everyone here that uh, the Burns Center has a couple of other events just like this coming up on April 5th hosting Audrey Tang, the digital minister of Taiwan. We didn't really get into, you know, TikTok, China. Uh, there's so much we could have talked about, Tom, but um, the digital minister of Taiwan will be uh, at Northeastern's AI in Action Week. So uh, look to the Burn Center site for more on that. And on the 11th of April, Rebooting Democracy in the Age of AI, the lecture series I referenced before, continues with a discussion on AI and participatory planning uh, with Urbanist AI, hosted in partnership with the School of Architecture, in person at the Center uh, for Design at Northeastern. So please check that out at burns.northeastern.edu. And with that, thank you everyone live with us on LinkedIn and on Zoom. And thank you, Tom Wheeler. That was a great conversation. And uh, thank you to everyone who's listening uh, asynchronously. Uh, and we look forward to your comments and emails as well. Thanks thank you, John. It's been a privilege to be with you all.